And now we join Catherine Altman as she discusses the history behind the photographs and photo albums featured in the new book Altman, now available to purchase on Amazon.com and other major book retailers. And the last thing in the world I had in mind as I was making, when I married Bob in 1959, it was our third marriage, and we were kind of starting a new life, and we brought children to the marriage and had more children, and uh, I just felt that taking all the photographs, which in those days, you know, it was like Instamatic or uh, whatever they, we have the various camera fads that were going around, and you go to the market or the drugstore and get your prints, you know, it was a very exciting kind of thing. And uh, I just didn't want the ball to end up in a drawer somewhere, like I'd seen so much happen with friends of mine. and. And I just figured I didn't want to, I wanted to keep them all together. It was kind of a compulsion, <laughs> as it turned out, because I was I did it for, God, 40-some years. You know, I'd take it with me on locations and, and, uh, and just kind of keep it going and crop them and have fun with them. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and one day, <clears throat> the, shortly after, about a year or two after Bob's death, the, uh, Mitchell Zukoff uh, wrote an oral history. I don't know if you're familiar with that book or not. Uh, was that Altman on Altman? No, that was David Thompson. Th- this was after his death, and it's an oral history. It's really quite fa- fabulous, and uh, the author is Mitchell Zukoff. And uh, it had a pretty good run. Check it out. It's a good book. Uh, Mitchell Zukoff. Yeah, Z, Z is in zoo, U-K-O-F-F. And so he um, he was interviewing me in my home in Malibu, or in uh, wherever I was, Santa Monica I am now. And um, somehow or other, something came about photographs, about family photographs. I said, well, there are no, you know, there's no 8 by 10 glossies, there's no production stuff, but I kept albums of just family. And so he wanted to look at them, and he just got carried away with them, and he took lots of pictures out, took them, had them copied, and then brought them back and replaced them properly into their slots in the album. And so they are in that book. And so when the next step, a couple of years later, when the uh, the uh, documentary, documentarian, the filmmaker, have you seen the documentary, by the way? Oh, yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, he did a great job, Ron yeah. Man. So he remembered seeing those pictures, but he, too, then called on the use of them, and he came to California and scanned a lot of the material that he ultimately used in the uh, in the documentary. And they just, you know, they became kind of a life of their own. It's kind of interesting, and uh, I'm very happy about them. They're 11 by 14. I've got about 31 of them, I think. I stopped the year that Bob died. And uh, I think they're going to go into his archives. I hope. I'm working towards that right now eventually into his uh, archives, which are vast, at the uh, University of Michigan. Wow. Yeah, what's incredible, too, is in the book, there are also uh, documents, script pages, letters. Uh, there's a lot of great, interesting uh, uh, documents I related to his films. The ar- we got out of the archives. Yeah. No, there's even, like, uh, you know, script pages from mm-hmm. different ones and... Uh, no, it's really incredible because oh, there's it, so much stuff in that book, isn't there? Yeah, it's like uh, it's just like a treasure trove of. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I feel it. You know, there's a lot of it I haven't read yet. I'm gonna slowly going through it. It's just I'm so proud of it the way it turned out. And and with that in mind, and back to I guess your original question, is that um, Abrams Publishing Company, when they took on this uh, task of. Uh, of publishing this book, and this was all their idea, all from having been exposed to those albums and those two mediums I just mentioned. So that that was their their idea and their designer, wonderful guy, who did a beautiful job, I think, in designing the book. Yeah, it really creates a whole narrative for both his life and then eventually just his career in movies as well. Yeah, that's what I love, the way they were able to you know connect those two. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's interesting reading the book, also from you know different uh, articles that were written by actors he worked with, like uh, Michael Murphy, uh, and also James Franco, uh, which is sort of show, uh, you know, in those articles, uh, Robert's passion for making movies, and that uh, he always found ways to find solutions to make movies, even when it was very difficult to raise money. Uh, did you always see that in Robert? That sort of that drive to always find a way to make a movie, uh, no matter what the obstacles yeah, were? Yeah, it always amazed me. I mean, there were as many that fell apart as they were made, I can tell you. Uh, and, he, you know, he'd be disappointed, but then he'd pop right back up, and he'd just keep working on it. And 
he just made things happen. It's because that was his whole life, that kind of creative outlet. That was, uh, by that I mean in terms of other than family. Yeah. He didn't have hobbies. He didn't go on vacations. Uh, he didn't lie on beaches. He didn't uh, take cruises. He didn't, uh, all of our travels, which was vast, was all based on filmmaking. And so he just, that, that, that was, he, that, it, was, it was a hobby, a profession, and a love, all in one for him. What uh, probably was one of your uh, most exciting or, or fun uh, experiences being on a set with Robert? Oh, God, they were all so vastly different, <clears throat> which made them even more exciting. We had four different uh, ex uh, sessions or sp time frames in, uh, in Paris, four different projects, I'm trying to say. And, uh, and then we had um, two in London, and actually we... Shot a, shot a film in images, but in called images in Ireland, but edited in London. So we were there for a year, and then we were there for another year, much later for a play that he directed at Old Vic. And then we were at Jack. We were from Jackson, Mississippi, to Calgary, Canada, and, and you know all, some points in between, and uh, and up in the the the, the tree line above Montreal. I mean, we we were just. I, I can't say I liked one better than the other, because each one was a different and yet the same experience, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and it's interesting, his films, uh, you know, because he made so many different genres, different, he told so many different stories, it, they really did expand all over the world in terms of, you know, how uh -huh. they were filmed, everything. Everything, everywhere but the Far East, or even <laughs> the East, <laughs> or Asia. Yeah, I was curious too. Um, you mentioned the University of Michigan, and I know Robert uh, filmed Secret Honor there, and I believe he used his whole crew with students at the time. Was yeah, right? most of it, and they all got credit for it. Yeah, no, that was incredible with uh, Philip Baker Hall as Richard Nixon. Uh, Isn't that great? One of my favorite movies. Me too. Uh, I was also curious too about uh, a film that you think sort of to you represents Robert the most, or even a film that you think is kind of your favorite out of all of uh, Robert's. Well, is it Jeffrey? Is that your name? Yes. I can't. Um, I can't answer that really. I'm asked. That, I'm always asked that, and so is he. And because each one of them has a life of its own and a whole set of circumstances that are unique just to that particular project. And uh, he used to be asked that question constantly, and I'm asked it a lot now too in these Q and A's and various things that I've been doing. Uh, and he used to say, "It's kind of it's oblique," but he used to say. Uh, my films are like my children. My favorite one is always the one who is in need the most, or needs me the most. You know, who, who needs the press, who needs the publicity, who needs the support. And uh, that's how he felt about his films. And that's because he, he didn't really have a favorite either. Yeah. No, it's uh, yeah, it's hard because every film you sort of put in all of your energy, all of your passion. So. You that's know, right. You, you but always... he was great up to. Relieving, re releasing that and getting right on to the next one. Yeah, uh, what's interesting too in the book, uh, which I think is also, um, you know, you talk about all the different documents, also the, the lyrics in there from your son wrote the, the song in MASH, uh, Suicide is Painless. Uh-huh. Uh, it's really incredible how he ended up writing that song. Were you were you there as far as uh, at the time? Oh, yeah, he was, time? yeah well, he was going through that pre-hippie, well, full hippie, pre-teen, kind of just getting into that whole 60s scene. And he was writing, uh, we were having a lot of problems with him, actually, and trying to get him to find his way. And he uh, he was writing haiku, which was kind of a hippie thing to do in those days. And Bob said, well, if you're going to do that, why don't you do this? And he gave him the title. And he pulled together that song, and then Johnny Mandel's Fabulous Music, uh, that's how all that happened, and it was just kind of a, uh, it was the times, you know? Yeah. No, it's incredible, and that song went on to, uh, go to the television show as well, and, you know. Yes, but without the lyric. Yeah. Yeah. However, uh, it didn't make any difference. Yeah. Well, your sons, uh, have also continued, uh, working in film. Uh, Stephen Altman is a, a very prominent production designer. Uh, did you always know that they would continue sort of working in that tradition? Well, I'm sorry to say <laughs> we did, and we regretted it. Uh, we regretted our uh, our behavior on that subject greatly because uh, somehow for the, through the 70s and around the early 80s and all that, he was always shooting in the summer, so 
they were always with us, and they just all were kind of behind the camera all the time, and they just sort of decided what uh, path they chose to take in that business. And, and, and so now that's all we know, and we regretted that move, too, and not to have encouraged further education and then let them make their decision about the film business, but that didn't happen. So they're struggling like everybody else in the film business now. Yeah, but uh, no, it's incredible, uh, you know, sort of, you know, Steven's work as a production designer. He's done some uh, Yes, some he's done stuff. some beautiful stuff. Uh, I was, Actually, Gosford Park. Oh, yeah, totally. That's uh-huh. uh, a great achievement. Uh, in the book, um, there's some talk about uh, Robert's development of Ragtime, uh, which would eventually be made by Milos Forman. But what's interesting about uh, Robert's uh, development of the film was that he wanted to make it this expansive uh, miniseries. Uh, was he always passionate about ragtime, and did he ever sort of want to revive it in his own uh, in his own execution? Uh, the uh, publishers and the agent for A.L. Doctor who wrote the book uh, put him together with Bob. Bob was really hot right then too, and he loved the book. And uh, somehow or other, they got into this. He and Doctor O and a couple of producers they got into this uh, contractual thing with Dino De Laurentiis of a three-picture deal. And Dino De Laurentiis had the money, but he did not have the Altman point of view. And so the first film was Buffalo Bill and the Indians, and it was just full of conflict from, from the De Laurentiis people. And so by the time that was over, that deal that he had made for the three-picture deal, one of them being, the next one being a ragtime, was canceled. So he, he let it go. He was really good about that. He didn't dwell on, on losses or so-called failures, of which he didn't really ever had one. <laughs> but he didn't dwell on them anyway. You know, he just was off to the next project always. He's got that partic- a terrific, uh, I used to call him the rubber band man, you know, it's elasticity. Yeah, no, I think that's probably what, you know, sort of drove him to make so many films throughout his career. Uh, you know, while other filmmakers sort of can kind of dwell to get one particular film made, he was always finding different ones. And, and know, some of them were good, some of them were not so good, but he didn't stop him. He just kept going. I loved that in him. Right to the moment of his death, actually, Jeffrey, he was all so hot about this next picture. He had a start date. Uh, he died November 20th. He had a start date for February 6th for Hands on a Hard Body. He had it all cast and financed and ready to go. What was that film about? Oh, it's a great, it's based on a documentary. You've got to see it. It's called Hands on a Hard Body. And that's the name of the uh, documentary as well. And of course, he cast it beautifully. But the um, it's about a used car, about a car lot is somewhere in Texas, some kind of not so well known town in Texas. And every year, this car dealership puts a pickup truck uh, up for raffle, and they all draw their tickets. And I think it's maybe twelve people are are picked, and they have to stand there. And keep always keep at least one hand on the on the body of the car of the truck, and of course each one of them has their own ride. They get 15 minutes off every two hours or something to go to the bathroom or drink. Well, they can drink water. They can have people hand them water, but they always have to keep one hand on the car till it gets down to the very last person. You know, it's kind of like the old marathon uh, uh, premise, dance-a-thons and those things. I mean, what do they call them? Oh, yeah, the dance uh, marathons. Yeah. yeah. It's just that so same premise because by the time you know the last person's there, he can hardly stand up and is you know he's weak and he's tired, he's exhausted. But he gets in the car and drives it away. He's the winner or she, whoever it happens to be. And so he had a script written all around it and about that, and it, it would have been great. Uh, no, it's just uh, you know, he, like you said, you know, he always wanted to make movies. It wasn't there wasn't another hobby in his life. It really was uh, movies. Uh, None except. Uh, he played a very unusual game that Pierre Mignon, who is a Cana- French-Canadian um, cinematographer, did several things for Bob. He taught him this peculiar, unusual solitaire game that you play with tarot cards. And he played that constantly. And that, he always said, I'm working, I'm working, what I'm doing, I'm working. And I believe him. And nobody else could... Our kids tried to learn the game. Nobody could really learn the game. And so he was... That was <laughs> For him, that was a hobby. But he was working at the same time. You know, the mind was going a mile a minute. Yeah. I was curious, too, uh, in the book, you, you talk about... Um, well, it's sort of chronicled in the book how, at one point, Robert decided to move his company from Los Angeles to New York, uh... Was, was there a reason that Robert felt more comfortable sort of going to New York at a certain point? 
Well, he just lost all connection to California. And, and as he said in his later years in many interviews, he just, he just couldn't function under their uh, auspices. You know, it's like uh, art and commerce. They just don't go together. And I saw all, all those studios at that time and all the money uh, people were all uh, uh, all based on industry and and, uh, and money from sources other than creative sources. And... He said in a lot of interviews, he said, they make hats and I make shoes, <laughs> words to that effect. And that's what that kind of what opened up, him up, too, and that he involved so much uh, within the independent world, independent films. Yeah, no, he uh, he functioned really well within the independent film yes, system. Yes, he did. He was one of the beginning. He and Cassavetes, that whole period. Uh, I was curious, too, um, I know Robert had sort of a love for the theater, and many of his films were adaptations of stage plays. Uh, did did what was sort of Robert's uh, passion for theater, and what do you think? Well, I wouldn't that he say he had a passion it? for it. I know that prior to my meeting him, he was when he was trying to kind of find himself working at the uh, Calvin Company, which is an industrial film company in Kansas City, where he learned his craft because everybody did everything there. I know that he used to uh, he was involved in the community center, the Jewish community center, happened to be, and. Uh, and he directed a lot of stuff there, and I still hear from people that were involved in that, at that theater. But that was it until uh, he was offered um, uh, the uh, come back to the five and nine Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean to do that on Broadway, and so that sort of opened it up. And then he'd done a couple. Of, you know, he always found something to do creatively uh, between films, really, and that's how all those things came about, including Secret Honor. Yeah, no, that which uh, he did, he staged it, I think, in Los Angeles, and then uh, would eventually do the film version. Well, it was staged originally in Los Angeles, and we were brought to it by mutual friends, and everybody kind of collaborated, and then he ran it here in New York at an off-Broadway theater for, oh, two or three weeks. I don't think it did too well. I mean, it was just such a, you know, specific, uh, specialized piece. And then he took it to, and he was determined to keep it alive, and then he took it to, uh, uh, you know, to Michigan and filmed it. Yeah, I was curious um, because I know on uh, Prairie Home Companion, Paul Thomas Anderson uh, was on set every day and was sort of, uh, uh, I believe... Do you know how that happened? He was kind of a, a backup director because of the insurance That's company. right, exactly. Yeah. And his girlfriend, and still is, maybe wife by now, uh, was in the film, Maya Rudolph. And Paul was writing Let There Be Blood and Bob Nitsch, and, and But number one, he was a huge Altman fan. Yeah. As you can tell by most of his films, <laughs> I do say so. Anyway, and he's a lovely guy. I'm crazy about him. And he was just perfect. He and Bob just had the best relationship and just worked beautifully on that film because he could do all the leg work and, you know, running up and down the that Fitzgerald Theater and talking to the actors and collaborating with Bob. It was nice for everybody. Yeah, I know uh, sort of Paul Thomas Anderson talks a lot about the influence on his work of oh, Robert Altman's films. And, yeah, and, check out Boogie Nights. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear, and I, I'm ashamed to say it, I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to see his latest film, but again, the, some of the reviews I read is just a strict out homage to Bob, this Inherit the Wind, Inher uh, Inherent Vice. Oh, definitely. Uh, you should definitely. Have you seen it? Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful film, and especially uh -huh. The Long Goodbye, it sort of harkens back to. That's, yeah, that's what I've read. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious in the book, is there a certain area of the book that you kind of feel the proudest of in terms of layout or the photography that's used? Or uh... No, I don't think so, Jeffrey. I, I'm just pleased. That every, t every time I turn another page, it's just, it, it, you know, I, it took a long time, and I saw lots and lots of, they don't call them galleys anymore, they call them something else, but it's like that, big, great big pages, and read a lot of stuff. Then I just kind of pulled back, and and didn't see anything for quite a while during the last process. And then when it did come out in December, I'm still overwhelmed by it. So I don't, I, I'm going to read I, a lot of it. I haven't even had time to read. I've been doing a lot of press for uh, the documentary and the book. And I did a lot of film festivals for the documentary, and I've been doing book signing things in between New York and L.A. So uh, I'm determined. Uh, in fact, I'm going to start very soon. I'm going to read every word in that book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then yeah. I can answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was curious too about the about the documentary and uh, sort of how that 
proposition initially got the you know kind of got the ball rolling in terms of making. Well, it was it. a wonderful. Uh, it's all about timing, of course. But yeah. I was invited uh, uh, to the Torino Film Festival about three years ago. They were doing a retrospective and honoring Bob. It was a beautiful big event combined with with a big uh, um, gallery show and museums. It was a, it was great. And uh, while I was there, uh, this Canadian filmmaker, uh, Ron Mann had heard I was going to be there, and he knew people were involved with the festival. He kind of finagled his way over there to meet me, I'm saying goodness. And uh, he, uh, I just liked him right away. And uh, I had people with me that uh, helped me make decisions and so forth, and that I honor and trust. And uh, we all felt the same way about him. I, I just felt that he got Bob, you know what I mean? I mean that he had, and then I looked at a lot of work that he'd done, and it's just it's so interesting. It's vast in, in content in that he would do a film on grass, and then he'll do another one on Margaret Atwood, you know, that <laughs> he had his own distrib- distributing company, and uh, he just had some really, uh, a really terrific taste, and I just felt he was the perfect one. I was just kismet. I just thought it was the perfect one for... Uh, he was, and I was right. I, I just feel terrific about it. In fact, I'm having dinner with him tonight. I think he's trying to get something going with Laurie Anderson, which would be an interesting documentary. Yeah, uh, but Altman is such a, an interesting piece, and the way it was crafted, it just uh, it doesn't feel sort of you know like a generic documentary. Like not you know, at this, all. I was feels... a little worried about that, but it, it works. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so much. It feels so personal to Robert, and uh, also too, what's fascinating at the end of the film, you see footage of I think it's location scouting uh, that Robert was doing uh, before he passed away. That's the hands on the hard body thing I was just telling you about. Yeah, no, it's just mm-hmm. uh, incredible. Some great footage in there. Well, I'll tell them I'm having dinner with him tonight. He'll be thrilled.